Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we share some tips on removing wallpaper. That can be a really tough task, but not when you use our formula. Also, Chelsea Lipford-Wolf drops by to talk about her latest very ambitious woodworking project. Also, we get a little follow-up on one of Joe's simple solutions from a few weeks ago that's very interesting, and we love it when people comment on some of the things that we cover here on the podcast. Also, what can you do if you painted your deck a year ago and you really don't like like it now? Can you reverse that process? Well, you can, but it'll be a long, long day of work. Hey, Joe, what about a simple solution coming up? All right, Daniel, this time of year, people are fertilizing their plants outdoors, but what if you have a a hedge or a thick shrub or something you can't get to the base of the plant because it's really best to to put that fertilizer right at the base of the plant so it goes right to the root system. I've got a simple solution how to do that using a length of PVC pipe. All right, let's get started then. Let's go to Illinois right now and talk to Loretta. Loretta, welcome to the show. Thank you, and I do enjoy your show. <laughs> well, we oh, we appreciate you. that, and we, we want to help you with a, a little challenge you have. Tell us about this wallpaper. Okay. The, my grandson bought a home, and the dining room is uh, was papered, and they painted over it. And so now there's bubbles all in that, and I wondered what would be the best way to remove that and make that a nice job. Okay, all right. Well, certainly something that uh, people have to deal with quite a bit, and, you know, with it starting to bubble, that's one of the problems with painting over wallpaper because, you know, you're using a latex paint, so you have a high quantity of water in that paint. You put it over um, wallpaper, sooner or later it's going to start uh, releasing that glue behind the paper and that's where the bubbles start. And they never get any better. It's only going to get worse. So I don't blame you for wanting to take that um, take that down. I'll tell you, we have a really good formula that we have shared with a lot of people on our website. And uh, I can give you you know the basic part of the formula, but I would suggest going to todayshomeowner.com and put in wallpaper remover formula. And uh, it works very, very well. Basically, the first step is to get a little tool called a paper tiger. And it basically is just um, a funny little wheel. It's not very expensive at all. And it just... um, pokes hundreds and hundreds of holes in the face of the wallpaper. You just glide it over there, and basically what that's doing is putting small holes in. Uh, doesn't damage the wall. It's just basically just uh, very, very um, minor holes, and that allows the formula that we'll tell you about to soak through there. Then you use a pump-up sprayer, get the hottest water that you can, and then it's a mixture of wallpaper remover paste. Uh, generally, that's called diff. D-I-F. You also put in a little vinegar. You put in a little um, dishwashing liquid. Uh, Joe, what else is in that formula? Is that, it, isn't there some fabric softener yeah, or something fabric, like that? Yeah, fabric right. softener, which yep. surprises a lot of people. But yep. uh, I think the the reason for that is it helps to um, adhere to the wall because something like right. water vinegar, you know, is, is very liquidy, so it's going to run down. But anyway, you, you put that in a pump-up sprayer, and the exact quantities and everything, like I say, is on our website. But you put it in a pump-up sprayer and then saturate the wall. Go ahead and cover up everything and just really saturate it a number of times. And then what you want to do, Loretta, is to take a um, what they call painter's plastic, which is a very, very thin plastic, and just stick it to the wall. You won't have to tape it or anything because the moisture will hold it to the wall and then walk away and leave it. I would actually leave it overnight. The next day, you'll be amazed at how that wallpaper will peel right off the wall with just some gentle persuasion with like a six-inch drywall knife to just lift that paper right off there, allow the wall to dry. You may have a a nick here and there that you have to repair, but nowhere near as bad as if you try to tackle it in the way that it is right now. Uh, This is something that I've used myself many times, and we've recommended it to a lot of people, and it's the easy way to remove that wallpaper. Okay, that sounds great. It, it's a lot of work. I know that because I've removed paper before, but never that that's been painted over. 
Yeah, well, it, you, you'll see that this formula helps you an awful lot. And again, just, just go to the website and in our little search engine there, put in wallpaper remover. It also has videos and the formula there in the article, everything you need to make that a a, a very easy project for you and your son. And tell your son congratulations on getting a, get a house. Okay, and thank you so much for the good advice. Oh, our, our pleasure, and let us know if we can help you any other way. Thanks so much, Loretta. Hey, let's head out to Texas. Bob is on with us right now. Bob, we want to see if we can help you out with this situation in your kitchen. Uh, tell us all about it, and welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Thanks for taking the call. Sure. Well, a couple of years ago, uh, we put in new cabinets in the kitchen, and uh, the old cabinets had a fur down in which we... We wanted larger cabinets to go all the way to the ceiling, so that's what we uh, had made. And we took out the fur down, and being in a rather temperate climate, we didn't think that much about repairing the holes that were in the wall and ceiling. The new cabinets covered everything, and we thought, well, okay, we'll just cover it. Well, probably a big mistake. Uh, as the winter months arrived, uh, cold air came down through these holes and behind the cabinets and made a very cold kitchen. So, uh, particularly this past winter was very severe in the Texas area, and we thought, well, we need to do something about this. So that's the question. (laughs) Now that the cabinets are in place, there's crown molding, there's under cabinet lighting, there's a new uh, tile backsplash. What do we do? Well, first of all, it sounds like you got an awesome-looking kitchen there. We, we certainly don't want to tell you to remove all of that. Let me ask you a few questions. Um, the, the, the main part of the kitchen, is it on an inside wall or an outside wall where your cabinets are? Outside wall. Okay. All right. That makes it a little, little harder on dealing with that. Now, now do you have access directly ab- above the kitchen in an attic space? Yeah, it's there, but it's a ranch-style house with a relatively low hip roof right there. Uh, yeah, you can shimmy in and out. At, well, you used to be able to. I'm 74. I don't do that so well anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand that. The, the shimmying in the attic, that does uh, take a, a, y- a young, slender man to make sure the, that takes care of it. But shimmying, shimmying into the attic isn't a problem. It's shimmying out sometimes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first of all, on that part of it, I could see if you were able to access that upper area to – um, put a piece of foam in there. You could get foam that's a uh, two two inch thick, one sheet. Probably do the whole thing, cut it to where it fits tightly between the ceiling joist, and just push it down directly over those cabinets, and then put insulation on top of that. Certainly, that would be a good thermal blanket to prevent that cold air from infiltrating there. Um, but on the back side of it, Joe, what what do you think on the Um, back part of it that's uh, on the outside wall, I wonder if you'd be able to, I doubt you'd be able to see that from the attic because of the top plate would probably block access to that uh, upper part of the wall. Yeah, I'm not sure. But Bob, the the way to attack this would certainly be from the attic. Thankfully, you have an attic above there and not another living space above it. Um, And somebody could get in there. You know, I mean, there are insulation contractors and just general contractors who would cut could come in there and take a look at that and i don't think this is a problem that they can't solve it's just a matter of how best to do it and without seeing your situation it's hard for us to guess at it but if they can get into the attic directly above this space they could certainly fill it if it means getting some pump up and insul- pump in insulation and they can drop down a hose down into any kind of cavity and just pump in you know some kind of loose fill insulation and then as danny said you could block off what you can reach with either some um, rigid foam boards or even uh, rock wool insulation is good for blocking because it's so thick and dense and it's easier to sort of fit into spaces. Um, But I I think you're going to have to definitely do it from above, and I do not recommend taking down the cabinets. That would be, you know, as you said, maybe you should have done this beforehand, but at this point I would leave the cabinets in place and get someone in there up in the attic, let him shimmy shimmy into the attic and solve this problem for you. Okay, well, that's kind of what my thinking was, but uh, I thought a uh, second opinion would be good to have. Well, we're glad to do that, Bob, and I hope everything goes goes well for you. And uh, congratulations on your kitchen renovation. Don't let this don't let this uh, dampen the spirits. Okay, very good. Okay, thanks, thanks so much. Guys. Alrighty, thank You're you. Welcome. Have a great weekend. 
time for our best new product segment brought to you by the Home Depot. How doers get more done. By now, most of us know the value of a smart thermostat, even if we don't have one yet. Now, they can save a lot of energy by turning the temperature up or down when we leave the house, and they'll allow you to control it from anywhere with our smartphones and other devices. But now, the new Google Nest takes that a step further by offering voice control through the Google Home app so you can change the temperature without even getting off the couch or or out of bed. Just say, hey, Google, turn up the heat. I can really get used to that, I think. It, It also looks out for your heating and cooling system. If something just doesn't seem right, it'll send you an alert or can send you helpful reminders when it's time to change your filter, which is extremely important for the health of your heating and cooling system. Now, in addition to Google, the Nest also works with Alexa on other smart devices, and it's easy to install yourself, usually in 30 minutes or less. So it might have gotten you a lot of uh, got your attention there. So if you'd like to see more about this, this product, and again, it's called the Google Nest Smart Thermostat. Just head over to Home Depot. Dot com. I tell you, they're getting smarter and smarter. And the voice-activated things, um, you know, you with a lot of these smart devices and such, Joe, people, um, you know, used to you used to kind of think of them almost as gadgets. But right. I started realizing, yeah. you know, with some of the voice commands, uh, you know, I, I have a I have a brother that um, can't see very well anymore, and he's has such so much struggle in reading text, reading emails, right. and things yeah. like that. And uh, he found that a lot of the voice-activated things that he's using now that you can send text. Text, of course, by um, just talking to your phone and different things right, like yeah. that. It really starts bringing on a very practical, realistic application in a lot of situations with families. Yeah, I guess you don't know until you invent something like that and put it out in the world how useful it can be. And if you're sitting on a couch often enough and saying, hey, Google, turn up the heat, how long before these smart devices say, hey, how about getting off the couch and turning it up yourself? That's, a, <laughs> that's the next step in smart technology. I think so. The the smart Alec uh, smart devices, right? <laughs> that's that's right. <laughs> the smart Alec. You. Yeah. Alexi. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. <laughs> In the studio with us right now, Chelsea Lipford Wolf for the latest on checking in with Chelsea. How are you doing today? Doing great. Well, you certainly took on an ambitious project there. I was able to see a little bit of it. Um, tell us all about it and what inspired you to take on this project. Three thousand dollars. <laughs> 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 no, I found I um, I built a bathroom vanity for our new hallway bathroom that we're renovating. Um, I found one that I loved. Um, and it cost $3,000 on Pottery Barn. Well, I'm not going to spend that kind of money on something that has to be shipped and can possibly be damaged on its way to me. And it wasn't quite exactly what I wanted, so I decided to build my own. Um, And, I mean, it's all the measurements and the figuring, to me, is the hardest part because you have to consider your final trim and everything as you're building it. Um, And anyway, I have all of the details at checkinwithchelsea.com so you can build the exact replica of my six-foot double sink vanity. Um, I used a bunch of products that I found at woodcraft.com, so I was able to partner with them for this vanity. And um, pocket holes, um, what else did I use? Like a a rip cut so I could rip plywood without um, any help. You know, when you're cutting big sheet goods, Mm -hmm. On a table saw, you really need a second hand or a second set of hands just to make it um, feasible. So I was able to use um, a jig on my circular saw to make those cuts. Um, My beloved paint sprayer, of course, (laughs) to put that final um, coat of paint on it instead of leaving it. um, I love the look of natural wood, Mm -hmm. um, but I decided to paint it a fun color since this is um, for our kids' bathroom. And you had a unique doors. I mean, you have the the trim around it. But what did you use on the inside, the ba- basic part of the doors? Right. Well, I used plywood, and then I stapled a sheet of caning on top of the plywood. So you kind of the rattan, um, I don't know, a little bit um, sunroom look to mm-hmm. it. And then used just some simple trim to cover the edges of the caning on the front of the doors. And did you build it up, Chelsea, and put baseboard like a kick plate and then baseboard to match the rest of the room? Well, no, actually, I used some wood furniture feet. So it's raised up off the ground about... So it looks like a freestanding piece almost. Exactly. It looks like a piece of furniture. And then it will be kind of... um, It'll be in the middle of the room. Like it's not going to be up against two walls. It'll just be on the the one wall floating. I see. And what do you do for the countertop, for the vanity top? Um, We had our... uh, I'm having a 
countertop fabricated to fit it and have the two sinks put in. Beautiful. Yeah. Is it going to be stone top, you think? Granite top? Yes, it'll be. Yeah, it'll be uh, made of stone. Beautiful. I understand you went out to the fabrication um, facility for that and uh, saw a very interesting uh, $250,000 machine that was cutting out your your little top. Yeah, I asked them if I could borrow it, and they wouldn't let me. I don't understand. (laughs) It was a little hard to load on the truck. (laughs) Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We um, shot some uh, footage um, for the TV show, which will be airing um, soon. of the renovation of our hall bathroom. And so I got to go see the countertops being or countertop cut and mm-hmm. have the sinks cut out. And it was a really neat process and just, I don't know, appreciates helps you appreciate the trades more and all the different little hands that go into renovating a home. That's right. Yeah. It's going to be a great looking uh, project. We'll keep you posted on when that episode will air on today's homeowner television, but you need to drop by checking in with Chelsea.com. You'll be able to see the details on this and also dozens and dozens of other videos that Chelsea has produced over the years. And uh, she mentioned Woodcraft. You also need to check out Woodcraft.com or if you have a retail store um, nearby, Um, drop in and browse around there. I think you'll be surprised at all the different things that are available there, whether you're a someone that's really into crafting or whether you're a woodworker, a serious one, or just getting started. A lot of things happening there at Woodcraft. Thanks so much, Chelsea, for being with us today. DIY means sawdust, work gloves, and the right tools. But at the Home Depot, the right tools means more than hammers and saws. It means a mobile app with built-in image search. That's a tool. Access an entire rental department with a swipe. That's another tool. For any project, start to finish, this isn't just DIY. This is doing like never before. This is The Home Depot. How doers get more done. Download our mobile app to get started. Hey, we want to hear from you, and it's very, very easy to do so. You can give us a call at 800-946-4420. That's the Today's Homeowner Hotline. We get a lot of calls there each and every week. Sometimes people don't leave their name and number, but they still need an answer. We're going to tackle a couple of those right now. Hey, Joe. Hey, Denny. I appreciate you guys so much. Listening to your uh, tip the other day, uh, Joe, about protecting uh, finished work on saw horses. That's a great idea with the uh, carpet tip. Uh, another thing I might add to that is uh, if you don't have carpeting or remnants, you might want to try, as I have, using, believe it or not, uh, pool noodles. You can get those at the dollar store or wherever. And uh, just bring them home, slip one side, and they'll slip right over your sawhorse. And then uh, just use duct tape to secure them. And when you're finished, just cut the duct tape and uh, store them away until you need them again. Okay. Thanks so much. We love you guys. We appreciate that, Tom. And that's a good example there, Joe, where uh, our today's homeowner audience, our community of homeowners helping one another. This was yeah. going back to a tip that, that you shared, of course, about, um, as Tom mentioned, using scrap carpet and taping it to the top of your saw horses so that you're not scratching up any of the finished work that you might be doing. And and here's another use for pool noodles. I think we could do that's an entire right. show on homeowner uses of pool noodles other than soaking in your tub or That's in your right. pool. <laughs> in your pool. Well, th- thank you, Tom. That is a great idea. And I'm a little embarrassed. I didn't think of that myself because I've had maybe, I don't know, Danny, six or eight simple solutions I just using yeah. pool noodles. Mm-hmm. And they're still only like a dollar a piece, right. which yeah. is amazing. Um, and you can find them pretty much year round, at least up here in Connecticut, you can find them during the spring and summer. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of great uses and that is a great one as well. Just slit them and slip them over because usually they have sawhorses have a two by four on edge mm-hmm. so it'd be just the right width That's to right. Uh, open it up and slip it on good idea tom thank you very much call us anytime 24 hours a day seven days a week 800-946-4420 let's grab another one of these calls from charlie in virginia that is charlie burgess in virginia and my question is i have an awning it's got mildew on it and some mold what can i put on it it's a canvas awning so it won't destroy the campus. Well, that's one of the things, Charlie. You have to be really careful. They, they can get very fragile, and I've seen people rip their hauntings to pieces using a pressure washer. That's something that I would recommend that you not use, but it's a common problem. And, and Joe, I understand they uh, actually have uh, cleaners now that are designed right. yep. to clean it sufficiently but still being passive enough that it doesn't cause any damage or fading. 
Yeah, if you went to a um, hardware store or home center, you could probably find they make um, canvas cleaners. Some of them are actually called awning cleaners. I know Camco makes one. That's C-A-M-C-O, Camco. And there's a company called Thedford, T-H-E-T-F-O-R-D. Mm-hmm. They make one called Premium RV Awning Cleaner because a lot of recreational vehicles have awnings. But really, any mold or mildew cleaner would work, wet and forget. Or there's one that's a professional grade called M, what is it? It's RMR86, which is a professional grade mold and mildew cleaner. Um, but if you wanted to try a homemade solution, I would recommend either diluting some oxygen bleach in warm water and scrubbing it lightly with a long handle scrub brush. Or you can mix two parts of water with one part white vinegar. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about those two homemade solutions is they're not going to, you know, they're pretty mild. They're not going to ruin the the canvas. And the oxygen bleach, unlike chlorine bleach, is not going to bleach out any color. If you get it on your clothes, it's not going to bleach out your clothes. So um, that's what I would recommend. I guess I would try the homemade solution first. If you had to, then you could go and find a commercial cleaner made specifically for canvas awnings. All right, let's switch to an email here we got from Forrest in South Carolina. We have a concrete walkway with several sets of steps that leads from our house down to our dock on the river. That sounds kind of nice. But a lot of those steps have chipped or broken corners, and there's just so many that need to be repaired. Is there some way I can repair them without having to build a dozen different sets of forms for the concrete? Well, this is something that we hear about a lot, and for a repair like this, you're describing uh, something that is uh, pretty common. You know, you, you you need something, first of all, that's going to bond really well to the existing concrete, and, of course, you're going to want to be able to mold it and shape it to match the contour of the steps without sagging. Now, the best material I've seen for that is Quickrete's Polymer Modified Structural Repair. I use this on a retaining wall recently and it held up really really well this material is a dry powder that you mix with water to create a clay like consistency that can be troweled right into the repair area and you may want to do this in several layers to build it out now because of its rapid hardening high strength and minimal shrinkage it's ideal for this kind of sculpting and molding that your situation is going to require plus the special polymer resins in the formula give it that great bonding strength so that you know it'll stay in place this really works well used it myself and you can find out all about it and the whole line of quickrete concrete repair products by heading by quickrete.com. Right now, we're going to head to Louisiana. Daryl's on the phone. Daryl, tell us all about this deck, and welcome to the show. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, no, I, I have a deck, and I made it with uh, treated lumber, mm-hmm. uh, but we decided to paint it. My wife wanted it white, so we painted it white, and then I think I heard on your program that that's not a good idea to paint a deck. And right. so I didn't mm-hmm. know if it was if it was uh, worth me sanding everything and trying to get it off or just try to maintain the white as long as I can. It's only a year old. But, I mean, it's showing wear and, you know, weathering and that sort of thing. And I was wondering the best way to keep it clean and stuff because I can't really pressure wash it. I got you. Okay. Well, uh, the reason that we discourage um, painting a deck is because uh, it really obligates you. You know, it, it it covers up the grain of the wood. It's sealing off the pores of the wood. I mean, it certainly will help the deck last a lot longer, but it tends, especially if you have a, a, a color like white, it's going to show everything. You know, yeah. it's going to it's going to start wearing out. It's going to start releasing from the treated wood and things like that. Now, um, you could strip that off, but boy, that is is that's going to be quite a challenge. Um, you know, really? a lot, lot of times with decks, um, it's hard to sand it all off because you have handrails or you have obstructions to keep from getting that mechanical sander, uh, you know, in all of the areas there. Right. And then chemical stripping, um, sometimes that goes fairly well, but other times it can be just as a, a labor intensive as as something else. So I'm, I'm not sure there is it, it. Does it tend to be kind of um, slick? Uh, can you, uh, it uh, it does when it when it gets wet. It is you can tell, and it's not on a slope or anything. It's just a flat, mm-hmm. spot, you know. But you can I can tell walking on it. You have to be very careful, or or I think you would you would slip. Um, and it, like I said, it's only a year old and looked good, obviously, when we first painted it. But now it's just really. You know, it's showing any little thing that gets on it. It, it just kind of looks drab. Mm-hmm. Well, you certainly can um, 
sand it a little bit and paint it with a you know a different color okay. you can add texture in the paint so that you you know have a so the more of a non-slip surface right. um, also um one, one of our friends um Deitch coatings has this really cool um um uh, clear sealant called track safe Okay. And uh, I used it on a, um, a deck recently. Also used it on some concrete steps. And uh, very interesting. It, you, 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 it's just a clear liquid. You don't even know that it's on there. But it creates just a little bit of tackiness, I guess you would say, that um, prevents a, a fall. And uh, okay. so that might be an option to that. But still, I think I think the main thing will be is just your. Now that you've painted it, you're going to have to to stick with that. Maybe choose a different color. Um, you know, in some of the real traffic patterns, there's also places that you can put some of the anti-skid material that's almost like sandpaper Mm -hmm. and that'll cover up some of it help protect some of the treads joe do you have any any thoughts on it because uh it's really tough to reverse that decision on painting yeah daryl as you said now you know why we don't recommend painting a deck (laughs) but how much deck are we talking about what what is the it's a walkway it's um it's probably five feet wide and then uh maybe 30 feet you know, from one it's okay. from one structure to another structure, and we just it's you know instead of walking on the dirt and stuff going back and forth, right. we made the deck. Okay. And it, are the railings on it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't have railings. It's just a it's just a walkway. Oh, that's good. That's good, 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 good. Well, what I would recommend uh, again, you know, this is gonna as Danny mentioned, this is gonna be a maintenance concern as long as it's painted. At this stage, I would if there are any surface screws or surface nails. <laughs> I would set them as set them down at least a quarter of an inch, and rent a a, a sander or a grinder or whatever, you need and just get that paint off. Okay. And then put on a semi-transparent stain. That that's what I would do. This way, you'd be done once and for all. I suspect this is relatively close to the ground, right? Yeah. Well, uh, in some spots, the ground is closer than others because it's sort of a a dip where it you know goes from one place right. to the other. So. Right. But yeah, it is kind of close. Yeah, the reason I asked you, you're in Louisiana, it's very hot and yes, it is. high humidity, and, mo- and you get that moisture coming up, it's going to be, you probably didn't paint the backs of no, the boards, so that no. moisture is going to pass through, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You could take those boards off and flip them over. Yeah, I guess I could, I didn't think about that. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to sand the edges, I guess, because you might see the edges of the ends, but right. if the boards are only a year old, I mean, that might be, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm trying to figure out what would be more work, Yeah, you know, getting the <laughs> yeah. sander down there. Um, I would try flipping over a couple of boards and see what you think. Okay. That's a good idea. I didn't think of that. Yeah. And if your white wants it white, I would get a white semi-transparent stain to make semi-transparent. I don't know if it's like pure white. It might be, Mm -hmm. you know, it might not be white, white, but it'd be close enough. So uh, that's what I would do. Flip over a couple of boards and see, see what it looks like. Great. DIY means sawdust work gloves, and the right tools. But at the Home Depot, the right tools means more than hammers and saws. It means a mobile app with built-in image search. That's a tool. Access an entire rental department with a swipe. That's another tool. For any project, start to finish, this isn't just DIY. This is doing like never before. This is the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Download our mobile app to get started. There are over 500 video versions of Simple Solutions featuring my buddy Joe Truini, but he's got a brand new one to share with you right now. All right, Danny, here's how to fertilize thick shrubs or bushes or other really dense plants that can that can be kind of difficult to fertilize because you can't easily reach the base of the plant. It's always better to apply fertilizer right at the base or around the base of the plant. So here's how to simplify that. Take a, a length of two-inch diameter PVC pipe and cut it to about five foot long or so. They usually come in 10 foot length. So if you get one and cut it in half at five foot, you you can do this in two different locations. But in any case, cut it five foot long and trim one end of it at 45 degree angles. The square cut and then the other end could just be square cut. Now you stand close close to the plant, like climb in there and get as close to the plant as you can and slide the square end down to the base of the plant and pour the fertilizer through the the 45 degree and the reason you cut it at 45 degrees it gives you a slightly larger target for pouring in whatever you're pouring down the fertilizer sometimes the fertilizer is granular sometimes it's been more often than not diluted with water but in any case you pour it down the pipe and it delivers it right to the base of the plant and then you can use then you, you can also use it to deliver water of course as well and then you just pull out the pipe and you know you're not putting it in there permanently you just bring it in whenever you need it and you can move it around 
So that's the trick. If it's a really thick hedge or shrub, there's no way to get to the base of that plant. So try this with the PVC pipe and deliver that fertilizer right where the plant needs it. Well, it's a great, great idea. And, and, you know, it does emphasize the need to really read the instructions on fertilizer. There's a lot of That's times right. that uh, I see people that, you know, you ride by their yard and, and e- either there's st- um, stripes of dead grass or stripes <laughs> right. of beautiful green grass next <laughs> exactly. to kind of a pale green grass, you know, and, and you have to do, do th- you have to read it and, uh, you know, all of the things about whether you should have it wet or not, or whether it should right. be dry a period of time or whether you water it in, all of those things are extremely important to, to make, to let that fertilizer work and also doing it at the right time of the year. Um, you know, uh, some of the people that sell fertilizer and everything will make you believe that you need to be fertilized in at least every other Saturday. And that's right. not yes. the case in, in most situations. No. And you can, if you just read the label, you know, on the back of the bag, really is what you need to do or contact the manufacturer's website and put in like, sometimes you can put in your zip code and it tells you, you know, based on your, your zone of the country, the best way to do it. We had a neighbor move up from New York city, bought the house next door, just down the street. And, um, it was a weekend summer place and he doesn't, it was all new to him. So he went out and he wanted to get his lawn nice and green. He bought a bag. He thought it was weed killer. It was actually a grass killer. And he had this, and he had, and he bought one of those, uh, walk behind spreaders and he just was wandering aimlessly over his lawn. So he had this like snake shaped brown dead grass strip oh, going man. all over his lawn. Yeah, let's read those instructions so last, there. Last, last time he did that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, now it's time for our podcast question of the week. This one comes in from Diane from Kansas. Hey, Danny, I'm wanting to paint my metal door. What is the best process to do this? Also, what paint would you recommend? You know, Joe, over the years, those uh, metal doors, they were really, really popular where you basically had a skin of metal on each side and then right. filled with foam. So yep. they were fairly lightweight fairly durable but i'm telling you when that sun hits that that metal it heats up then it cools down right. it's hard to keep paint on there and it surprises a lot of people um that you really don't want to use a metal paint on a metal door they've uh, shown that you want to of course prime it very well right but this is where the elasticity nature of latex paint really comes in handy that's exactly right and what uh, i'd recommend for diane to do is first clean the door really well even just warm soapy water something like that to get all the dust and dirt off and once it's dry sand it lightly with just 220 grit sandpaper nothing mm-hmm. too coarse remove the sanding dust of course whenever you sand anything you always have to remove the sanding dust you can use a tack cloth which is something specifically made for that but even just a damp paper towel will work to let it dry and then i'd recommend priming it if you don't have to prime the whole door but at least prime any areas if you've exposed any rust certainly or any any metal been exposed from the light sanding or maybe just because it's old and the metal's exposed so you want to seal that up then apply Um, Two or three thin coats. I think you're better off applying, especially to a metal door, two or three thin coats of paint instead of one heavy one. And she asked what kind of paint. Well, you can just use a high quality, 100% latex house paint. I would recommend there's paint called house and trim paint, which is usually Mm -hmm. gloss. It's either semi-gloss or high gloss. You don't want a flat or even an eggshell. I think you want something a little glossy because a trim, including a door. And I found a paint recently, Danny, and any high quality house paint would work by the way but there's a company called modern masters and they make a paint specifically for front doors it's actually called never fade front door paint and it's a latex paint that does a superior job of resisting fading which is always the issue especially if the door is in is exposed to direct sunlight um diane doesn't mention you know this is facing you know south or east or something like that but in any case so um it's pretty expensive but it works really well and again it's called modern masters never fade front door paint. There you go. Um, uh, Diane, hope that helps you out on, on that problem because you, you want to make sure that front door always looks good. And that is something that does require a little bit of maintenance. I think that's one of the tips we have for the summer four seasons of home ownership, you know, uh-huh. dress up that front door and this might be a good way to do it. Yeah, great idea. Thank you so much for that, Diane. We'd love to hear from you. If you have a question for us to answer for you here on the podcast, just send it to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. And as we always say, thank you so much for those great reviews that we continue to get. We're still trying to build up our audience as much as we can so that we can help as many homeowners as we possibly can. That's what we like to do here at Today's Homeowner. I'm Danny Lipford along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. We'll see you soon.